Hello, everyone. I am Joe Flick with the Montana State Library. I'm hosting today our website chat, and um, Tracy Cook is standing in for Jenny Stapp because Jenny has been called into a budget meeting at the Capitol, and uh, Tracy will be saying a little more about that in a minute. But let me just give you a few little updates. Hold on just a second. Let me adjust my screen here. So um, we do record all of the website chats, and I make a real effort to get them posted um, as soon as possible. Only if there's a real bad technical glitch will, you, will it be the next day. So it'll always, almost always be posted the same day within a couple hours of the finish of the website chat because this is very newsy information. And so, we, and we know that a lot of you do watch the website chats um, immediately following them. So there's actually always um, viewers over the weekend. So you can always count on that and on our Vimeo channel. And if you ever need the link directly to the website chat show place, just send me an email and I'd be happy to share that direct link with you if you have any trouble finding it. So if you ever miss a website chat, you can always catch them on um, the recording. Just a few notes, we still have a pretty busy training season ahead. Um, and I noticed Debbie uh, Kramer's here and the Montana Library Association is going to be doing their virtual conference, not on my list here, sorry, but coming up next month. So look for that. We just started a new Aspen basics course. So the next cl class is March. Oh, I didn't finish putting that in. It's a week from Wednesday. Um, so we're doing these every other week and they'll run through most of May. So the first one is just kind of a quick tour. You can watch the recording if you want. They're all about a half hour long. We've managed to get them shortened up a little bit. We realized it didn't really need an hour for each session. So if you have new staff, you can let them know um, that about this. And once we have all of these recorded, uh, they make a nice little package to hand to your new staff to help them with onboarding and get them kind of up and going with Aspen. So you don't have to do that. <laughs> we also have a user's manual for Aspen that's um, that I'm just about done with the draft. So it should be posted soon. And that I think you'll find helpful too um, with new staff. And maybe you might find it helpful for you if you're doing a few things in Aspen that you don't do that very often, um, like updating your organization information or something like that. There'll be information in the user's manual We've got lots of summer reading webinars. I should say we, Amelia has, got, has really planned um, a, a, a real, a bunch. And there's like three, two or three scheduled for next week, but with within the next couple of weeks. So check the Aspen um, events calendar for those. She's also been busy um, with our economic development program and the Small Business Administration has a webinar next week. And she's also been working with Humanities Montana on their democracy project, which is engages with libraries. And I see that Anor Bray is here. One, she's one of the libraries that's been participating um, on that. So if you want to know about any of those things, check out those events on Aspen. I think the next couple of weeks, there's about I don't know, eight or 10 um, webinars scheduled. So lots and lots of training coming your way. And then I just today we're going to um, actually have two presenters. Tracy's going to start, but um, Suzanne is here as well because she's been um, on the inside with the American Recovery Plan Act funding for E-rate, some uh, seven is billion dollars is a, a lot of zeros after those seven that seven that's could certainly impact libraries so Tracy I'm just going to turn everything over to you right. well thanks everyone and Jenny sends her apologies uh, although it is good news that she's being called into the governor's office because they're talking to her about the stimulus funding in the American Recovery Plan Act and kind of just ideas for ways we can help libraries. So I'm going to start with a legislative session update and then kind of move into the American Recovery Plan Act. In terms of the legislative session, we did pass what's called transmittal. So transmittal is where basically any policy bills have to go 
be handled, heard, and voted on and moved to the other house. So if they started in the House, they need to be ready to go to the Senate or vice versa. There are still um, bills out there that have to do with revenue or what they call study resolution bills. And those bills have a little bit longer period of time before they have to move to the other chamber, so to speak. So um, what happens during transmittal break is a lot of bills kind of fall off um, and we no longer need to follow them. There are, however, a few of them that we are following. We are following House Bill 501, um, which is about criminal trespass is the language that is used. But when you read the bill, it's actually a bill about uh, not you, you cannot uh, say that someone's trespassing or kick someone out of your institution for not wearing a face mask. So you could have a face mask policy, but you wouldn't be able to enforce it. This did pass the House. Um, county attorneys are against this bill. As many of you might know, there it begin, becomes tricky when you have a policy that you're not enforcing. But it is right now in the Senate. It's been referred to the Senate Judiciary Committee, but no hearing has been scheduled. But that is a bill that we are watching because we know that's very important to libraries right now. The other bills that we're watching are, have to do with um, local health boards. And there's a real movement. There's both a Senate bill and a House bill to have it where local health boards must get approval from their elected officials. Um, in most cases, that would be the county commission before they could basically make any changes. So we're watching those bills as well. And then some of the bills we're watching that have to do with the State Library is House Bill 2, which is the budget bill. So that sets the budgets for all state agencies for two years. And knock on wood, um, right now with House Appropriations, uh, everything is moving in a positive direction for the State Library and its budget. And then we are also watching House Bill 374, which has to do with the uh, coal tax funds. And as many of you might know, coal tax funds over the years have gone down. So even though we might be appropriated, which means we have the authority to spend about $450,000, we don't receive that revenue. And so obviously we can't spend it if we don't receive it. So this bill would for another two year period basically take general fund, state general fund money and uh, make up the difference between what we receive from coal and what we are authorized to spend. I think the other thing I wanted to make people aware of that I just saw this morning is House Bill 632 sponsored by Frank Garner. Um, this is a bill that just outlines what the state is receiving from the American Recovery Plan Act. And I want you to know that there's about $409 million for local governments. And we do know that some libraries were able to benefit and get some of the original funding from previous stimulus bills through that same mechanism. So, you know, you might want to get in touch with your local government officials, maybe not right now because they're probably still figuring it out themselves, um, but there may be some funding that you can use to help with library expenses, especially anything related to COVID or anything kind of about rebuilding as well. So those are kind of the bills I wanted to, to highlight right now. I'll just kind of pause and see if anyone has any questions. I noticed Joe did also post in the chat. Nothing in the chat. In terms of questions, you can put, put your questions into the chat anytime and I will bring them to the attention of Tracy or whoever's presenting, but you're also welcome to just unmute your microphone, jump into the conversation. We're always happy to either answer questions or hear a different point of view. And Mary Drew asked, what was the name of that last bill? Its number is uh, 632, it's House Bill 632. And so, um, and then if you Kit go, was asking, oh, I'll go ahead, finish. Yeah, um, 
and Joe, I have mine on full screen, but if you could pop in the link for the legislature, it's leg.mt.gov. If you go there and you just do search bill, you can type in HB 632 and you'll be able to see it. And I actually recommend doing that because the bill outlines how much money Montana is getting and, and how it's allocated. And then Kit, can we review the formula about coal money again? <laughs> yeah, Kit, that's an easy question. <laughs> so coal tax money, this is basically kind of interest in royalties that are earned on uh, revenue that coal and oil companies make. It goes into a big fund. I am very much simplifying this because truthfully, I would have to have the law right in front of me to be able to give exact percentages. But that money is then divided up among schools, conservation districts, and libraries receive a small percentage of that funding. And in, at the state library, the biggest use or the biggest ticket item for coal tax funds are to pay for the um, funding for the six library federations in Montana. So we divide up 225,000 amongst the six of them. And then the next biggest use of that money is to reduce the cost for libraries of OCLC and the Montana Share Catalog. And then there's some other ways that we've used the money in the past, but those those three things really use up a lot of the funding. And so what I was talking about was uh, over time, those revenues have been going down. So even though we might be told, well, you can spend 450,000, we actually don't get that revenue in hand. We don't have the cash. And so what this bill is doing is it's just basically saying that the Department of Revenue is going to take a look at that. And if we don't receive what we're authorized to spend, then it will come from the state general fund and it will make up the difference. So did that answer your question, Kit? Oh, so I gave you way more information than you needed. I'm not very good at like monitoring chat while I talk. Uh, yeah, yep. So Karen, that money does go to us at the State Library and through us. Got it. Good questions. Any others? All right. Well, I will move on to ARPA, the American Recovery Plan Act. And what this meant for us is specifically the Institute of Museum and Library Services was given an additional one time only 200 million to divide up amongst all the state libraries. And Montana's portion is $2,235,000. So this is in addition to the um, LSTA Library Services and Technology Act funds that we already receive, which is 1 million. It's over 1 million, but actually, Kara, do you know the number off the top of your head, how much we get through our Llsta? Well, it's roughly a million. Okay. <laughs> I do not have the better. exact numbers. <laughs> I know Jenny's like way better than I am at knowing these exact numbers off the top of her head. We but this is basically $2,235,000 more than that. And we received I guess a heads up that that might be happening. So when we met with the Network Advisory Council in early March, we asked them, if we get this money, how do you want to spend it? And I mean, it was resounding that the council members asked us to please continue the hotspot program. So the hotspot program is scheduled to end basically September 30th. And so they're saying we want you to continue that, that program beyond September 30th. So that was priority number one. And then they also mentioned e-resources. They mentioned some different e-resources, including the magazines and overdrive, as well as more content for Montana Library to go. They hadn't worked out all of the details on that. But those were the two things that kind of rose to the top about how they would want to use that extra funding. And so the State Library Commission will take preliminary action on April 14th. Um, at this time, 
IMLS, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, is working out the details for spending the money and how long we have. So we need that information. Um, but we will ask the commission to kind of take some preliminary action at their April meeting. And then the Network Advisory Council and the commission will work on the rest of the funding and how to allocate it and have additional discussions in May and June. So that's kind of the plan for um, those two items. Tracy, is, yeah. this is Joe. When, and when is that funding expected to arrive and when does it need to be spent, do you think? So the arrival, I don't know. Um, I know IMLS is working on that. And I don't know if Kara's, Kara's our coordinator. So I don't know if you've heard any, any rumors, Kara, on when it's supposed to arrive. I have not heard anything. Okay. The when is it going to be spent, Joe? That's the big question mark. And so um, that's for the Institute of Museum and Library Services to determine. Um, you know, Jenny is hopeful and the state libraries are kind of lobbying to have a longer timeline so that we can be thoughtful and kind of work out a budget um, and, and be able to do things like continue the hotspot program for as long as we can. It's a good question. Any other questions? All right. So the commission and NAC update. I am um, very glad that Pam is on this call because she was instrumental in working with several librarians to rewrite the Excellent Library Services Award. We had heard for years that it was just awkward that they were tied to the public library standards, especially for different types of libraries. And so she worked with these librarians to rewrite uh, the criteria and the State Library Commission at their March meeting did accept that. And so the ELSA will be changing over the next year. And Pam, do you mind just kind of briefly talking about some of the changes that are in the new award? Sure, I can try and do that. Um, we have made it a little more, oh, I guess kind of like a survey where you answer some questions. And we also added a spot where not all the criteria apply to some libraries. That was a, a comment that we heard a lot from some different kinds of libraries where they didn't really meet some of those criteria. So we've changed them. So now if you're doing something where you feel like it does support the criteria listed there, you can explain it and say, yeah, we are meeting this criteria because we do this. Um, so we're looking for more libraries to be able to get this award because we do know that there's lots of really good, excellent libraries out there. Um, and also, I think it will give us some ideas of what libraries are doing, too, that we haven't had as a choice in the survey before in the application, but we'll get to hear some great programs. So my plan is to get with the committee one more time and come up with some examples of things that would support some of these questions, because that was a comment that came up was, well, what do you mean by this particular criteria? What would what would be one of those? So we'll have some examples in the application process when we do put it out there. And at the division meetings at MLA and at the fall federation meetings, we'll probably go over the application a little bit more to explain it of what's out there. But it's a little more interactive and you'll be able to supply more information um, to explain what you're doing to show that you're giving excellent service. Thank you, Pam. And of course, if you have any questions about any of this update, just post them in the chat or you are welcome to unmute your mic. The other um, information that Jenny asked me to talk about was the Montana Library Network and the Network Advisory Council. This is a conversation that we've been having for the last several months um, with different community members in the library world, as well as the Network Advisory Council. Uh, the concept behind it is kind of like a reboot of the Network Advisory Council, which over the years has grown to be quite large. And 
what the commission voted to do in April was to basically restructure the NAC and make it a little smaller and make it a board um, that oversees this concept of the Montana Library Network. And so the Montana Library Network is basically, I like how Bruce words it, he kind of calls it a promise, but it's the concept behind it is that Montana libraries belong to this network and they can take advantage of whatever services the network offers that they want to. And the Network Advisory Council is kind of charged with planning for it, defining those core services, and then asking librarians who are interested, like for instance, if you're really, really interested in cataloging or you're really very interested in Montana Library to Go and eBooks and so forth, to serve on what's called a core services committee. And in that committee, you'll look at that service and you'll identify kind of what funding it needs, what you think Montanans want to get out of that service, you know, what you think we should be paying attention to in the future, what kind of challenges or barriers that service is facing. And then that information goes to the Network Advisory Council. And it's their job to prioritize the funding for the services to kind of help um, the that service to kind of direct state library staff and others to address some of those barriers and challenges and then to kind of in a way softly advocate for those services to the state library commission and so the commission did vote to go down that path and the network advisory council spent a big chunk of their march meeting kind of looking at a job description for this network advisory council thinking about the size of it thinking about what knowledge and skills they believe that council members should have and I think both the commission and the current network advisory council members do see this board as as really trying to bring people together, but also to have vision. And I kind of like how Jenny said, like success is you have $10 million worth of things you need, and you're able to kind of communicate that and communicate what you do if, if like, for instance, we got $2 million. So it was pretty interesting to hear the Network Advisory Council kind of talk about that. And I don't mean to put her on the spot, but if Hanor's still here, she's one of our council members. And if you'd like to add anything, Hanor, that'd be great. Well, I think it's really exciting because I was on the NAC when it was first started many, many, many years ago, and then um, disconnected from it for quite a few years and back on it now. And I'm really excited to see it going in the direction that it used to go. Um, it gave libraries an opportunity to think about the things that they really wanted and what really helps libraries do their work and um, gave the commission and the state library an opportunity to hear from libraries about what they think is important and what direction they want to go in. So um, for many years in the middle, I heard people say, this is the most boring thing I've ever done. We don't really do anything except for rubber stamp whatever we're asked to do and so I think that the commission and Jenny and their staff have worked really hard to say we don't want a rubber stamp we want people to tell us what they really want and so this is all of our opportunity to work on a committee or um, a working group that you're really excited about and want to push ideas forward. And it's really exciting that the State Library is giving people this opportunity. So thank you, all of you. Thank you, Hanor. So that's kind of what I have for the Commission and Network Advisory Council. Are there any questions on that? And I know it takes a few minutes to type in chat. So that's why I'm kind of pausing and not just rushing on to the next thing. All right. So I am going to share a URL in the chat. Oops, just just a minute. A quick yep. question of when does the new process um, begin? Oh yeah, from Beth. Mm -hmm. So the it began 
really is the answer, Beth, with the March meeting of the Network Advisory Council. But it's going to basically take us several months to work through it because we don't want to forget anything or to, to drop anything. So the Network Advisory Council will kind of continue in its current form and will work through a lot of this kind of initial like job description and duties and so forth. And then the idea is we would shift to kind of the new Network Advisory Council probably in the next fiscal year. And so um, we will be bringing forward ideas for uh, new council members for the commission to consider. One thing that's different about this is the commission will appoint the Network Advisory Council now, which is, which is great. Um, currently it's an application process. Yep, you bet. Thank you, Joe. All right, and feel free to ask any questions about anything I've talked about, because I know sometimes you think of things afterwards. The website that I put in the chat, you, you might already be aware of this. I wanted to share it in case you were unaware of it. Um, there is an initiative to help educators, pre-K through 12 educators and childcare workers uh, get their vaccinations. And the federal government is um, handing out vaccine supplies to pharmacies. And so that URL has information about that process. I share it with you for a couple of reasons. One, I've learned over the years that public librarians are pretty tuned in to the educators in their community. And it's a way for you to kind of share this information in case you might have teachers or childcare workers who are not aware. The other reason I'm sharing it with you is I, I do know in one case, you know, one library director just kind of called and said, hey, if you have any vaccines left over, I'd love for my staff to be vaccinated. And she was able to get five of her staff on the list. And so I'm in case you are not in the queue to get a vaccination, if that's something that's of interest to you, you could maybe just call and ask to be placed on a waiting list. And I share that because a lot of people see even public librarians as being closely connected to the education world. This is Joe, and I can add, you know, um, on on the Blackfeet Reservation where I live, um, the Indian Health Services are vaccinating anyone over 18 who lives or works on the reservation. You do not need to be Native American or an enrolled tribal member to receive that. And most of those, um, the except like in on my reservation, they're accepting walk-ins as well as um, appointments. So if your library works with a nearby reservation, you might check and see if, if your staff might be eligible to um, get vaccinated there. And there is a question in the chat. What is the real guidance with those who are vaccinated but have multiple underlying conditions? Is it safe to be in a public library? working with the public? If they're, you mean after they're vaccinated, Jennifer? Yes. I do not know. Tracy? Yeah, I, I do not know. I mean, I know the CDC has given some guidance, but I don't know that they've addressed the multiple underlying conditions. I mean, I think they, for most people who are fully vaccinated, and that's actually if you have the two shot program, that's two weeks after your second shot, you can be with other people who've been fully vaccinated without a mask in small groups, but they still are recommending wearing masks and practicing social distancing. So I, I am not sure, Jennifer. I can see if the CDC has any information about that and email it to you, but I do not know off the top of my head. Any other questions on anything I've covered before I turn it over to Suzanne? I just wanna add that um, as information becomes available and if there is a need for uh, us to host more discussions about the evolving situation with COVID, uh, just let us know. I mean, Amelia is scheduling us some chats, some meetups, as necessary. So, just let us know if there's if it's time for us all to get back together, and 
will do that, or she will. <laughs> Sorry, Suzanne, didn't mean to cut into your presentation there. Take yes, it away. Suzanne, it's all yours. That's OK. Um, I, I wanted a few minutes to talk a bit about um, a provision in the um, recovery program uh, for E-rate support, because there's over $7 billion in that. So I think it's worth talking about a little bit. And um, it's classified as emergency educational connection and devices. And um, what's interesting about that is for one thing, it's retroactive. And so it goes back to January 1st, 2020. So one of the things I would suggest, um, I think most of you who have hotspots and devices um, got them through the state. And so they were already funded as part of a different um, grant program, but for those of you who may have bought some of your own, um, either for your own use or, you know, to supplement what um, we gave you, um, if I would suggest holding on to the receipts for those, um, for both the devices and the um, charges, if you've been paying for additional um, monthly monthly cellular service to support um, hotspots and or connected devices, because um, you may be able to get reimbursement for that. This is under the E-rate program. And so um, FCC has 60 days from when this was passed to come up with um, their provisions for how they're going to dispense this money. I think um, it's going to be 100% of um, whatever they're funding. So it won't have the discounts that the usual E-rate program has attached to it. And like I said, it does cover um, Wi-Fi hotspots. It also covers modems, routers, devices that combine a modem and a router. So, um, and connected devices, which include tablets, um, PCs, um, Chromebooks, that kind of thing. Um, it started January, it goes back to January 1st, 2020. It will extend to um, June 30th after a year after the emergency has been declared ended, whenever that is. So um, it's a little bit nebulous for how long it will extend, but um, it is sometime into the future. So it's also something to consider if you want to add on. I think it might be something, um, it's meant to for at-home usage, which is something definitely new in the E-rate program. And they've been asking for input on that. And um, ALA and Shelby and some other groups have been providing input on that. So um, like I say, we'll see what they come up with. Hopefully the application process will not be as drawn out and horrendous as um, the usual application process is. I think the, uh, the idea is to get this money out as quickly as possible. Um, I also think it's worth considering, I haven't discussed this with my colleagues at the State Library, but um, you know, it, it opens up an opportunity for us that maybe we don't need to be taking this money that we're getting from other sources and putting it into um, hotspots and um, and charges if if we can transfer some of that to this to this program. But then you know I don't know we'll have to see how that works. Um, I think there's also possibilities of using this funding for um, people who want to extend their Wi-Fi beyond the building. So, um, you know, say, for example, you know, you've considered um, extending it out to, you know, the parking lot or um, an adjacent area so that, you know, people could use it a little bit more freely um, when the library is closed and, and you need some additional equipment for that. So, you know, routers, you know, could be um, bought and upgraded that access points, that kind of thing that would enable you to do that. Um, we don't know exactly what it's going to look like yet. We should before too long. And I'll keep you posted because we're um, certainly discussing this 
as part of the ALA E-rate task force and as the state E-rate coordinators. Unfortunately, um, ALA is on furlough next week, so hopefully there won't be a lot of it going on next week. Great timing on these things, but we don't necessarily get to choose uh, when this stuff comes up, uh, but um, we'll keep you posted as we learn more. So if anybody has any questions about that, yeah, it's One of the money. questions was what does the Ar ARPA stand for? And it is the stimulus package that was just passed, yes, signed yesterday. And uh, so it's very, very new, hot off the presses, and it does stand for American Recovery Plan Act. And seven billion where is, and how does that compare, uh, Suzanne, to like the E-rate money that's kind of usually, available normally? Yeah, usually every year it's about two billion. And so this is a serious infusion of cash. Um, Another question from Beth in, Bo in Bozeman, what might the, be the process for reimbursement? Do you have any idea yet? Nope. No. <laughs> None. <laughs> None whatsoever. Just maybe be ready to. Uh, so if you if you yeah. ha are purchasing things right now, or um, have purchased recently, keep some documentation. Yep, that's that's my advice. Mostly at this point is you know anything that you purchased in the last year. You know if you have receipts, by all means hang on to them. Um, that you may be able to get um, reimbursed for it and. Um, and anything you might be considering purchasing in the near future, you know, make sure you keep receipts for that. And in answer to Hanor, do you have to be a current E-rate participant? No, you don't. Well, I'm almost positive about that. I shouldn't say, you know, that's a definitive. Probably but not. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> You'll I probably say, be able to enroll in the E-rate program exactly. and, and take advantage of this infusion of funding. Yeah. Yeah. So if it just hasn't been worth it for you in the past, it might be worth it for you to think about now. Suzanne, you're going to be very a very busy woman. Hopefully. I, I would like it to be very busy and for Montana to be able to take advantage of this because we've left a whole lot of E-rate money on the table you know, over the past several years. Um, there's been a lot of money as far as you know, equipment upgrades, you know, Wi-Fi, um, you know, for improving your Wi-Fi, for doing wiring in your libraries that people just haven't taken advantage of. And another comment, this from um, Karen and Ennis, maybe some advice if a library put in for new, a new equipment discount, should we just buy it and hope for a reimbursement? Um, I think let's talk about that, Karen, because I'd like some more specifics about that about what you're talking about with your equipment and your discounts. It's kind of a one-on-one -on -one conversation, uh, depending yeah. on the situation, sure. Yeah. And then from Michelle um, in West Yellowstone, she had to step away for a moment. She had business in the library, but she'd be interested in getting more hotspots. And so how do we sign up and request more? Did she miss that discussion? Um, and so, Michelle, we're, we are actually discussing the um, American Recovery Plan Act, which just passed Congress late yesterday, and we're just beginning to learn some of the impacts that it's going to have. Um, so it's very, Tracy, do you want, Tracy, Suzanne, you want to jump in here, how that's going to Well, I think there's probably, back? there will, there may well be a couple of different opportunities for you to do this, and what um, what I was just talking about was the e ray program, which is going to offer funding for um, for hotspots and um, and services. So um, I'm thinking you could most certainly take advantage of that. <clears throat> now, as to whether or not the the state library will be um, purchasing more hotspots and additional service plans, I don't think we've looked at or discussed that yet. So, um, you know, that's, that's a possibility as well with the funding that we get, um, but that remains to be seen, right, Tracy? Yeah, definitely. The other possibility, Michelle, and I don't know if this is a possibility, but you could email John Kilgour. He has been in touch with some libraries who aren't seeing a lot of usage and have a lot of hotspots, and I I believe he has some that he's received back. They may very well be 
already you know taken um, but it might be worth emailing him to just say hey we'd love some more if you have any and if he does i'm sure he will send them to you Redis redistribution reallocation you know. i popped john's email into the chat and i am and we do, have discovered that some some libraries based on their cell service in their area and their topography that's kind of things they can't actually change have have not have found that the hotspots aren't very useful in their area so uh so there is there may be some sort of shuffling and and as tracy said earlier it, the NAC certainly suggested that the hotspot program was a very high priority for any additional funding that the library we at the library might receive from this from ARPA from the American Recovery Plan Act. And with that, um, unless you two have anything else to add, I will go ahead and stop our recording. That was a lot. I think we're good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Suzanne, for stepping in um, at the last minute um, as Jenny was called away to that budget hearing. And I'm sure watch your email. If I know Jenny, she will be um, uh, providing an update as she soon will. as she has uh, information that she can share. And uh, I bet next we may be having a website, another website chat sooner rather than later with all this stuff going on all all at once here so thank you for for tuning in and attending today <laughs>